Hello and welcome to WTA's latest webinar, What Executives Need to Know About Cybersecurity. My name is Robert Bell. I'm Executive Director of World Teleport Association. Uh, WTA uh, serves a number of purposes and we've been doing it since 1985. Uh, teleports tend to be the unseen stepchild of the satellite business and yet they play a vital role in connecting the digital skyway to the digital highway. And uh, so we, sir, we our, our purpose really is to advocate for the interests of those teleport operators, particularly their commercial interests, because they are experts at turning connectivity into high value services. And at the same time, we want to promote higher excellence in their operations in technology and business practices so they can uh, compete in an increasingly complex market and do it effectively. This webinar is part of an educational series that WGA has been working on since May of, 19, of last year with the goal of trying to help our members and other teleport operators make sense of cybersecurity. Uh, for the biggest companies in our industry, of which there are only a handful in terms of being teleport operators, um, they can afford the staffing, the budgets, um, the expertise required to produce a rock solid uh, security profile. For the small and mid-sized business, it's much more challenging because this priority has to compete with so many others. And so in, for the last year and uh, a bit, we have been working to educate teleport operators on where it makes sense to spend money, where it doesn't, how to avoid confusion, how to budget, and how to understand how you can get the highest payoff from the investments that you do make. Uh, in this webinar, after our introduction, we'll be turning to a panel of extremely expert people with, a, with backgrounds that I think you'll find very valuable. WGA's research reports and webinars on this topic, as well as in, on so many others, is made possible by the support of a set of members that we call WGA industry leaders. Uh, they are UTELSAT, Intelsat, Kratos, Liquid Telecom, and SES, and we're very grateful to them for that support that makes possible these programs. Okay, cybersecurity, making sense of it. Um, whenever I hear a public presentation by a cybersecurity expert, such as we'll be hearing from today, it always brings to mind that famous line, and I had to look up where it came from because I, I had long since forgotten, and it is, abandon hope, all ye who enter here. And it comes from Dante's Inferno, for those of you who, who care about such things. I think it's a very appropriate saying because if it's not automated scanning for open ports or it's sophisticated hackers targeting your specific operation or your own employees reusing their passwords or clicking on links and emails or sticking unknown USBs that they find in a parking lot into their computers, it seems to be just endless and unstoppable in terms of risk. And yet, of course, if that were true, the gentleman that we're about to speak with wouldn't have jobs. Now, big companies, as I mentioned, can really afford to have a lot of tools in the cybersecurity toolbox, and for the smaller company, well, not so much. And so that's really the focus of our conversation today. Um, and we're going to, oh, I'm sorry, one more thing I wanted to say, actually, about, about this program. Um, it's actually the, the cybersecurity education program is actually part of our tele teleport certification program, which goes back now several years. And that program makes is based upon a set of open standards that we've published, and it enables people, to, uh, teleport operators, to apply for a public certification of their facility based upon its its uh, technology, its facilities, and its procedures, uh, starting out with a provisional certification, which is based upon the self-reported data they give to us, and proceeding, as most of them do, to a full certification based upon an audit by a WTA auditor. But from that program, we have for some time been pulling out the data that helps us reveal what's, what areas of vulnerability perhaps are going underappreciated, or in this case, um, cybersecurity is a particular focus and we want to help companies do a better job with that. So th th this is part of our, cyber our certification program now, and you'll be seeing other similar content coming out in the future. So at last, we can turn to our panelists. Um, they are Matthew Bybee, who is the Chief Information Security Officer of SATCOM Direct. Matthew has served over his career in a, a wide variety of technology and security roles for manufacturing, healthcare, financial organizations, from small to medium-sized businesses, all the way up to multinational organizations with tens of thousands of employees. So he's very, very well prepared to address the, the big issues 
uh, in our business as well as the uh, the harsh realities that come when you have to make budget decisions. Joining him is Chris Folletra, who's the director of teleport services at ComSat. And Chris has an interesting background um, because well, he, he started out at GTE Telecom International in Massachusetts in 1986, which is one year after one year after WTA was founded. So there you go. Um, he's served as a, a engineer in many different walks here, but the interesting part for us is he's also worked for Comtech EF Data. So he has both the technology and product chops as well as the day-to-day -day experience at running a teleport where cybersecurity has to be one of the significant issues we deal with. And finally on our panel is Justin Padilla, who's Director of Cybersecurity Services at Kratos uh, Space Training and Cybersecurity Division. Uh, so as, as you would expect, he's an expert in such things as CPI, uh, cyber compliance, penetration testing, and continuous monitoring. And this crosses cloud, finance, health transportation, et cetera. Before joining Kratos, he, uh, he dis actually did this work for a global management consulting firm where his primary, primary focus was cybersecurity architecture, cloud automation, all those buzzwords, uh, some of which are covered in our most recent report. So um, Matthew, Chris, and Justin, welcome to our program. Thank you for having me. Okay, uh, just a reminder to everybody, again, we have that questions panel, and that's your best way of making sure that the, the things that you're most interested in get covered in this discussion. Uh, so go ahead and feel free to fill that out, and I will get alerted by our team that I'm supposed to pay attention to it, uh, which I sometimes forget to do in the heat of the discussion, and bring your questions and issues into the discussion. Okay, so, I want to start out with just a big, big question. WTA did just publish this white paper, the cybersecurity buzzwords every executive needs to know. Buzzwords aside, what are the sort of top cybersecurity concepts that it's important for business leaders to understand? And just to make life simple, Matthew, let's start with you. Perfect. Uh, Yep, there you oh, are. <laughs> just, just dealing with mute, that's fine. We're all used to that technology. <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate, uh, again, appreciate the opportunity to take part uh, in the discussion today. Um, I, I think the primary concept that I think uh, a lot of people need to understand is that um, security and cybersecurity, the, all, all the things around that, um, is really a journey, right? There, there's no destination. There's no glorious endpoint, right? That uh, that marks or whether you've achieved, you know, nirvana when it comes to securing your organization or your data or your resources. And um, I, I think, you know, it's always a process, right? It's a mix of um, of addressing security in terms of people, process, and technology. Um, and, uh, it, you know, that's not something you can easily just put boxes around, right? Because uh, each one of those things um, changes every day, right? And so I think um, yeah, at its core, um, that's really a concept that, that we um, as practitioners and we as an executives really you know, need to understand that there's no one size fits all solution, right? Um, and that uh, things are gonna happen. It's just inevitable, right? And the more important thing is, is do you have some, uh, you know, are you executing on the tactical and some of the fundamental things, right? That will, uh, help you when things go bad to to be able to recover and be uh, a more resilient organization. <laughs> okay, so we'll never get to the end of the journey. Uh, it's all about how you respond because you have to accept the fact that bad things are going to happen. That's um, I know that's first time I ever heard that, that advice in, in conference. I thought, okay, well, I'm I'm screwed, uh, but nonetheless, yeah. it's good advice. Chris, what about you? What are, what are the concepts, the the one to one to three concepts that you think every manager needs to carry around with them as they're focusing on this issue? So I'm taking a look at it specifically from a independent teleport operator, and when we are running a network, 95% of the time it's not our network. We are providing a um, you know means to an end for a service provider 
And so we do not have control of the entire service. So our goal is to get the data from whatever remote facilities to their main operations center in a seamless and secure way. And so we have to take a look at certain mechanisms of not only now the satellite infrastructure, or the, you know, the SATCOM's infrastructure itself, but also how we're getting it into the terrestrial infrastructure and how we can protect that. So currently, you know, ComSat uses the SATCOM Direct um, data center services. And so we employ the, a more of a closed network um, architecture for our services and then do a handoff to them and allow them the larger organization that we're providing the service to as a, um, you know, at a secure point, at a meet me point that is then their point, their responsibility to take care of whatever data we're passing at that side. Okay. So that I think is the key uh, concept to understand as a small to medium independent teleport operator. Well, so let me just restate that. So basically, you've got to figure out where your boundaries are and make sure that you're protecting all the things you can protect while at the same time, if you will, almost protecting yourself from the other networks that you have to come in contact with. Have I got that about right? Yes, agreed. Yeah, okay. Interesting. Interesting. I hadn't heard that before. Justin, what are your one or one to one to three takeaways, or rather I should say key concepts that you want your your customers, your clients to understand? Yeah, so, you know, from, from, from my perspective, when you look at the, the cybersecurity buzzwords that you mentioned, um, you know, many of these buzzwords are, can be addressed by, by looking back at the basics. And, and Matt, you mentioned the fundamentals. Um, but having a strong foundation uh, will, will take an organization a long way. Right. There's there's many different security tools. You can you can you know look down the street and probably see uh, another cybersecurity vendor here and there. But you know making sure that your that the basic security practices are strong are important, and you know making sure that the organization and the people that are within that organization are on board with security um, is another factor because 80% of uh, bad actors that get into the environment or, or issues that result from that um, are, are due to, you know, some sort of human error, whether that's a misconfiguration or um, an accidental introduction of, of some malicious thing into your environment. So people are always going to be an issue, but I want to just step back and, and maybe we'll just ask this question of, of all of our panelists. What are those most basic um, security factors that you need to be thinking about? And I know that it could be a very long list, but what's sort of at the top of that list for you? Yeah, so from, from my perspective, um, vulnerability management. So understanding the types of vulnerabilities that are in your environment is, is, is an important aspect. Um, there's a number of tools out there that can support, support you on this. Um, but then once those are identified, actually patching <laughs> or, or, or remediating those vulnerabilities. Because time and time again, I see organizations that do have vulnerability management program, but then when you look at um, the, the kind of basic configuration issues or, or patches that may not have been applied, um, you, you'll find that, that they're lacking in that aspect. Um, and that's of course where, where, where most of those news stories come from as we discover that some terrible virus has spread across 100,000 systems and lo, look, you know, lo and behold, none of them have been patched in five years. Yeah. Right, right, right. And, and so and, you know, that, that's, that's a pretty, pretty fundamental aspect. Um, um, and then, and then lastly, and maybe not, not lastly, but another one um, would be the identity and access management. So how do people access your environment? Do you know who's accessing your environment? Things like that. And, and when I say that people are like, oh, of course I do. Um, but many times, uh, you know, there's accounts out there that are stale or open um, that that people haven't used, and and those are entryways into your environment. Yeah, one of the things I've I've it's just a, from a personal experience, and this is hardly at the level you're talking about, but I've had my own personal experience of the amazing inability of organizations, including uh, you know, little, <laughs> including my church, to manage permissioning. 
In other words, it's easy to give people permission to do things, but taking it away, that's something that just is hard to make, you, make sure it gets done, at least in my experience. Is that, is that true on the sort of enterprise level as well? Uh, yeah, you, would, you wouldn't believe. You know, give somebody administrative <laughs> access and, 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 you know, they'll fight to the end to, to keep it, so. That's interesting. Um, what, I'm sorry, do you, uh, Matthew or Chris, do you, do you want to add something to this or before from, we move from on? The standpoint, from the standpoint of the teleports, it's important to understand separation. Um, there's a corporate infrastructure and a corporate network that the, the teams are running on and that Matthew's and Justin's purview to control. Um, what gets overlooked a lot of times is the, you know, the actual teleport networking infrastructure that's there and the fact that we, you know, somebody has now hooked a laptop up to um, something and that laptop hasn't been set up and secured. And so they, they plug it into a device that's in the network and all of a sudden acts all, you know, they, they can disseminate whatever happens. So it's a matter of, of understanding that keeping devices that are not part of the teleport services operations never ever touch that network. So we look at it um, from that services side as a separation thing. Right. Well, that really goes back to Justin's point that you have to understand what your vulnerabilities are, and that's obviously a big one. Okay. Well, let me go on to our. I'm sorry, Matthew. I didn't want didn't want to cut you off. Is that you want to have something to add to this? Yeah. I mean, just kind of to add what to what both and Chris and Justin talked about. You know, patching. It's really just block. You know, attacking. You know, and doing the the fundamentals in terms of, you know, patching. Patching is a hard thing to do, right? In every organization, whether you're a small organization or a large one, it's still a very challenging uh, activity. Um, and you know what Justin said uh, also around you know identity and access management, just having some visibility and who has access to your systems, right? And for how long? And when you talk about um, you know especially folks who've been with your organization a long time, um, you know how do you address whether uh, you know, those individuals really need, you know, the levels of access within your organization or your customer networks, right? Um, there's there's kind of a concept out there that's called least privilege. And really what that means is, is uh, only giving people the privileges that they need to be able to execute whatever their daily activities are, right? So, um, you know, you're not allowing people uh, access to your systems, you know, with root accounts or, you know, admin uh, level uh, accounts and that you um, put in place uh, processes to kind of give one to give you visibility to that and two to address that, you know, you don't need uh, generally speaking, you don't need, you know, all kinds of technology to manage that. That's more kind of a people and a process uh, challenge, I think, more so than it is a technology challenge. Um, by all means, technology can help you address that, but um, uh, oftentimes it's more just understanding and getting visibility and then putting some, you know, some healthy, practical processes in place to, to help mitigate, uh, you know, the, the sprawl of permissions or access or accounts. Yeah, I, this is work. This is we actually have a report that that mentions this, that goes into this in some depth, and it, it I find it deeply reassuring that for not, people who are not familiar with cybersecurity, it's a whole lot of you know crazy stuff and a zillion threats and and so forth. But fundamentals are really important, and we I think we've outlined some very very major ones that that uh, every manager could take take back to the operation and say, are we doing, you know, are we, do we understand our vulnerabilities? Are we managing access? Uh, and are we, do we understand where our borders are? So, so thank you. What common beliefs about cybersecurity that business leaders carry around with them are just absolutely not true? <laughs> Justin, would you like to address that first? <clears throat> Um, yeah, so I can I can I can take the first shot, and I might approach it differently than, than others. But um, from from a business leader perspective, uh, a common misconception is that cybersecurity is a subset of IT, right? And and it's really not, right? They have two different missions. 
IT focuses on you know keeping the business running smoothly, keeping operations going, things like that, and and that's kind of their main focus, right? To to you know, keep things going. Um, from a cybersecurity perspective, you know their main mission is to keep the business safe. Um, and so and so both can be mission um, uh, enablers, right? But um, they should they should be looked at differently. And so, so from a, from a leadership perspective, um, you know, you'll want to take a look at, at both sides and make sure that they're equipped um, in a way that that can help support the organization effectively. Right, and you, I mean, I, when, in our report on budgeting, we we had some you know amusing comments about about uh, budgeting as being a portion of the IT budget and so forth. And I remember when I was working on this, I was thinking, not as clearly as you stated it, but I was thinking, I'm not sure this is a good way to, to look at it. It really is a different mission. Uh, interesting. Chris, how about you? What's, uh, what, what, what have you encountered that, that the people who are making decisions think that just isn't true? I think um, the actual location that you're 35,000 feet in the air in an aircraft, you can't be hacked, that you're in the middle of the ocean, that you can't be hacked, that you're in this remote location that nobody's around, that you you can't be hacked. And so that a satellite, you know, network is completely unhacked, you know, is locked down. Um, I think that's a, a misconception. Um, there's still Wi-Fi that's being used. There's there's, you know, at some point that traffic is landing somewhere. Um, and it, it oh, gets you access. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that's the, you know, these, these locations that, you know, you're on a satellite network in some remote location and that makes it safe. My son-in-law once set up a web server and report it just you know it, it was working at home and he set up a web server so you know it became it became visible on the web and he said it was only 20 minutes before he first before he began getting probes from china so yeah there's no place to hide yeah. there's no place to hide matthew what have you encountered that that uh, leaders believe that just isn't so yeah, I think I think it's probably two things I, I would say. One is, you know, oftentimes, um, and we as security practitioners um, don't help in this regards oftentimes, but um, work, you know, cybersecurity or security folks are seen kind of as the no people. <laughs> no, you can't do that, right? No, you shouldn't do that. And rather than actually, you know, to Chris and Justin's point that really um, security, can be really a value add, right? It can actually um, enable the business from uh, from a you know a, a compliance perspective, or from you know just securing the data to um, being a uh, you know something that can distinguish you as uh, to your customers, right? In terms of showing value and importance on it, um, I think that's kind of one thing. You know, oftentimes we're we're seen as the people that stop everybody from being productive. And, and I think um, that, that's a very challenging thing and you gotta address that in different ways, you know, depending on, on your own internal culture. And then the second thing I would probably say is oftentimes security is kind of lumped in with compliance, kind of almost in the same way as Justin mentioned, you know, security and IT are the same thing. Um, security and compliance are, are really two different things. They have a lot of common commonalities between them. But uh, at the end of the day, if you're 100% secure, that doesn't mean you're compliant. And kind of the inverse is also true. Just because you're 100% compliant with whatever, you know, statutory or um, regulatory or contractual requirements doesn't necessarily equate that you're a secure organization, right? So um, I, I think those two things are, are generally kind of uh, mis, uh, misperceptions in terms of the role of cybersecurity in an organization. Interesting, interesting. Um, my third question is, is similar to our first, but you know, it's not so much concepts as the, what are the, what's, the sort of, what's the top issue and we've talked about some of this stuff, but what is the top issue that you want, think that those business leaders need to take seriously um, all the time 
uh, in terms of cybersecurity? Obviously, there's so many issues, but what's what's the one that's going to that's going to potentially cause the greatest damage to the enterprise? Matthew. Yeah, I, I think um, really it's it's users, right? It's employees. It's people who have access to the important things within your organization. And, and what are the things that you can do to protect the organization as it relates to users? And, you know, you go and you look at different studies out there, like the Verizon um, breach report or, or, or other things like that. And, and um, while there are you know, bad guys who are actively doing bad things in terms of, you know, trying to attack organizations, um, you know, and exploit vulnerabilities, oftentimes the the, the most uh, direct way, right, of exploiting or, uh, or, um, or, you know, breaching a company is through exploiting the trust, right, of, a, of an individual, right, whether that's through phishing or whether that's through, um, other social, um, you know, social type of, you know, campaigns or, or things like that. Um, I think that's really, if you're going to focus on one area, you need to focus on your employees and your users, right? And make sure that you educate them in terms of, you know, the um, what's good and what's bad, right? What, what uh, like, like what we talked about earlier, you know, identity and access management and least privilege and, you know, things like that, um, and what to look out for in terms of what, you know, what are the current threats, right? Phishing, spear phishing, whaling, you know, um, from an email perspective or, or, the not, or the like. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. One of the counterintuitive pieces of advice that I came across from one of our, our experts was, it's really, really important that you train your employees to know that if they've made a mistake, you know, if they've clicked on that link and then said, oh my God, goodness, I shouldn't have done that. But the first, their first call should be to the IT department and the IT department will not yell at them. It will thank them. Yeah. And this sort of goes back to your, your, you know, your I, I issue of being Dr. No in the IT department, right? I mean, people yeah. don't want to call because I've made a mistake. Instead, they need to be welcomed and thanked and made heroes because they saved the company by alerting IT right away to a potential breach. Yeah, absolutely. And, you, you know, one of the things that we do at SATCOM Direct is um, we, we've really worked hard to establish really that, that we're a trusted partner, right? And um, so if anybody sees anything odd, you know, that they have the freedom, right, and the liberty to contact us and let us know, you know, mm -hmm. it's kind of, you know, the current... Uh, the current buzzwords, if you see something, say something is absolutely mm -hmm. true, right? Like if you see something that's abnormal, like let us know and we'll take a look at it, you know? And uh, yeah. I, I think, you know, while that's not a panacea for solving all the problems, that's really to to equip people and to um, help, you know, that from a cultural perspective is really key to get that kind of buy-in, buy mm -hmm. excuse me. So. Chris, how about you? You've you've got the day to day, the day to day um, responsibility. What, what's what's the top issue that you want the the leaders of the company to to uh, to take seriously? I, I think it's the the point from the the actual connection of the teleport out to their their business infrastructure, and we get you know fights cost wise. Um, for customers that just request, um, I just want an internet connection. I, I, I want an open connection. Um, and, and I don't know that they always realize, you know, the vulnerabilities at those points of just opening up um, whatever we're passing through to just the internet, um, as opposed to connecting into our terrestrial infrastructure and setting connections up at meet, meet me points and all of that different um, security uh, steps that you take there. Just taking an internet connection and us pushing something out into the open world is is a problem. And they look at it sometimes from a cost perspective and that's where you shouldn't be cutting corners on costs. Right, right. Justin, what's your, uh, what's your top issue you think management needs to take seriously? Yeah, so you know, staying stagnant is is a big issue, right? You know, in in 2006, uh, Amazon came out with AWS, 
right? And, and there was a lot of reluctancy there. Um, and then, you know, looking at it today, right, you, you don't run into any business that's not in the cloud, right? And I think the same thing goes, you know, uh, on, on the teleport side, right? As, you know, people are moving toward, you know, from analog to, to digital and, um, you know, even, even the, the larger cloud infrastructures are, are setting up ground stations and things like that, right? Staying stagnant is not going to, uh, it's not going to propel the company forward, right? And, and security plays into that where, you know, as you start venturing into, you know, the, the newer technologies, you know, understanding what those are and, and the potential impacts is, is extremely important. And, and doing that earlier will help, help, you know, make sure that security is integrated as you, as changes are made within, within the, the environments. I think that's really important advice because the teleport industry is is facing a set of major you know opportunity slash changes in terms of integrating much much more closely with mobile networks, um, virtualizing their operations, um, getting into the whole you know, services orchestration, very complex uh, operational. Uh, procedures that are going to be required to really get into the data business in the way that the industry needs to do it. And, and security is going to be right there at every one of those discussions. Robert, really uh, I, I think that, um, you know, that was a key uh, point that Justin uh, spoke about with the stagnant. There was a time where teleport services, there was the, the satellite guys and there was the network guys and never the two shall meet. There was a connection point and I did my satellite stuff and they did their network stuff and we were off and running and that was it. And you guys were responsible for one thing and we were responsible for the other. At some point over the last, you know, 10 years, I would say, you know, all of a sudden the satellite um, people had to understand what the heck IP was. <laughs> and, you know, modems and, and things became network devices. And for a number of years, those network devices had very, very little security to them. I think we talked about the fact that, you know, it was, you know, published in a in a Comtech EF data manual that it was, you know, to access the control of that modem was, you know, the username was Comtech and the, the password was password. And those things sat there for six or seven years without anybody ever changing that. And it's sitting on a network management platform that sometimes customers had access to. So as the the network devices have improved and security has taken, you know, hold the, the importance of, of looking at older devices on your network and starting to upgrade those things and change those out so that your vulnerabilities aren't with these old routers and these old modems and old network devices that, you know, really lacked in security are also being taken a look at um, from an upgrade standpoint. Mm, interesting, yeah, yeah. Uh, we've talked briefly about the difference between security and compliance, um, and I think it's a really good distinction to make. What are the most important compliance or liability issues um, for teleport operators? Where, where's, where's the potential greatest concern? Um, Justin, I guess, why don't we start with you? Yeah, so as, as, as the market changes, right, right now, um, you know, a lot of our business is, is on the commercial side. Um, but uh, from a, uh, the other part of our business is, is focused heavily with the, you know, Department of Defense. Um, they've recently come out with uh, new compliance guidelines, uh, cybersecurity maturity model certification is what they're calling it. And... Um, you know, they establish different levels for organizations to meet and and the compliance aspect is, is pretty stringent as you as you move further up in the chain, right? And in, in the space industry, right? Um, that's that's critical infrastructure. And and you're gonna end up seeing that um, a lot of organizations are gonna need to meet uh, much more stringent requirements. Um, if they're doing business on, on the DOD side, which a lot of times, you know, will take what we've done great in the commercial industry and then, you know, 
the government wants to use it, right? And so in order to, in order to bridge that gap, um, they want to make sure that the, the supply chain and that the security practices are implemented. And that's not only, um, you know, on the network side, right? It touches every aspect of the organization, um, everything from, you know, awareness and training to, you know, secure development, right? And so um, from a compliance perspective, I would, I would keep a, a pulse on, on the latest requirements that, that you know, government is using if, if that's part of your business model. Well, question, does that tend, do those kind of compliance requirements tend over time to flow through into the commercial world? Well, as, as the industry um, grows, I, I think that, and, and it, it does, right? Because, um, you know, you look at, and, and I'll bring up a recent thing, um, the Hacker Security Conference, DEF CON, right? Recently um, did a program, and it was sponsored by the Air Force Research Laboratory. And that program was called Hackasat, where they basically brought in teams of hackers to, you know, hack satellites. And, and most of that started, you know, on the ground, right? Um, just the entry alone, there were 1,300 groups of hackers, right, that, that initially that started in that vein um, and then at the end right there there was you know the finals was it was only eight groups right and, and that did two things right a it was sponsored by the government so so it's it's you know sh showing showing light on on hey we want to we want to understand what the security uh, issues are within within the space industry right and then and then B what it did for those you know uh, you know, 12, uh, 1,292 groups that, that didn't make it to the finals, it piqued their interest, right? And so, so you have, you know, now thousands of, of people that may not have been um, as interested before. Now there, there's a lot more people that are interested, a lot more hackers, so to speak, that are, that are interested in, in, in satellite and those communications. So I think it'll naturally kind of span over into the commercial side as, as industry continues. Interesting, interesting. Um, Matthew, let's just jump up to you because I think you're the one who actually raised this issue. Uh, what do you think are the, the compliance or liability issues that should be of the greatest concern? Yeah, I, I kind of, you know, generally you kind of want to break these down to, you know, depending on where you're at, right, in the world, right? So you have typically kind of three type of requirements in the, in in this area. One would be your statutory requirements. So um, like in the U.S., right, you have certain um, federal laws, state laws, uh or even international laws, right, around um, privacy and protection of information, right? Although we may not, um, you know, be the uh, holder of that information, we do allow the transmission of that information across our, you know, our infrastructure or, or on, uh, on our customers' infrastructure. So whether that uh, information is, uh, you know, health information or that customer's health uh, has, uh, is a healthcare provider or something along that lines or, uh, or some other component, you know, it can bring in a lot of potential uh, statutory requirements, um, FTC, FCC, you know, things like that, or individual state laws. Um, the, the next part is really the, the regulatory side. So as Justin mentioned, um, on the defense side or, or government, you have FAR and DFAR, you have um, some NIST standards like 171 and, and the newer standard CMMC. Um, but you also have, uh, you know, uh, other like uh, regulatory things like NISPOM and, and um, different state uh, regulations um, from state to state, um, the European uh, GDPR, right, um, which may, may or may not necessarily be applicable in all circumstances, but it's definitely things you have to take notice of, right? And then really the last, the last thing um, is really the contractual requirements, right? When you sign a contract with a customer, what are you obligated to do, right, in terms of uh, um, being compliant, whether that's um, for you or for your customer, right? Um, so those things like typical 
uh, examples of that is like PCI, right? And um, a service organization control, like a say 16 to 18 um, type of, uh, uh, you know, type of um, requirement or, or just the general requirements of whatever um, data protection addendum with uh, either your customer or your third parties or, or whatever, so. Well, I'm, I'm already, I'm, I'm about ready to put my face in my hands and just start crying. <laughs> it's a lot. You know? It is a lot. Yeah, it is a lot. And it's, but I, I think you made an important point there, which is you need to distinguish between, you know, a general level of compliance, which is going to help you in, you know, the terrible event that you get a hack, which is impacting your customers. But you also have specific application specific health is a good example in the US and probably in Europe and other places as well. Um, and finally, the, the, very specialized requirements that may come out of a, you know, your location. Um, um, so, so thank you. I think that's a, a good way to think about it. Um, we published a report back in March called Budgeting for Cybersecurity, and it opened with some quotes from industry decision makers about how to set a budget. And my, my all time favorite from that list of quotes was this, pick a number and subtract that number from itself, that's your cybersecurity budget. Um, but of course, that's not exactly how we really wanna do this. So speaking more seriously, how should businesses be thinking about budgeting for cybersecurity? And Chris, I'm gonna, I, I missed you on this last question, but, but I'm gonna to come to you first. Um, how do you there at your company approach this issue? Well, our bonus is that we have a gentleman like Matthew on our team at, at the parent company to support it. But, um, you know, I, I think that one of the keys to understanding the budgeting is when you look at these RFPs that come in, the majority of the time they have no mention of any of the terrestrial um, infrastructure and protection of any of that data that's coming through the network. So usually when you're responding to some sort of an RFP, that hasn't been looked at yet. And what you should do in the initial stages is bring that up to the customer base so that it can be made aware and there needs to be some sort of budget that has to be put in for that. And so, you know, we've got the various, you know, compliance requirements across understanding what that data is, the HIPAA, uh, FISMA, whatever, you know, government or, you know, health records or, um, you know, like for the controls of storing credit card data and all of that kind of point of sale services, which are uh, very common in satellite networks. Um, we have to have that part of it uh, you know, that discussion as being part of the system. So don't be afraid to talk to your customer about cybersecurity. And the fact is that, that ultimately they're, ideally they're gonna be paying for the protection that they get. It's a, a really good lesson. Um, Justin, what about you? What's, what, uh, how, how do you recommend to your clients that they think about budgeting for this? Yeah, in, in, in kind of two ways, right? And I touched on it uh, initially, right? But But looking at, you know, cybersecurity as as its own kind of group, and and making sure that it's not just a smaller percentage of whatever the IT budget is, right? Because uh, again, those are, those are kind of those are kind of different missions. Um, but you know, for the for the smaller and, and mid-sized organizations, um, you know, you could potentially build in security, um, you know, all throughout the organization. It would just cost a lot of money, right? And and every dollar counts. So, um, you know, I would say to to you know also look at some of the the larger providers of security and and those org those larger organizations that can invest that that those big dollars into securing um, their products or solutions um, and and leverage those. A lot of people are hesitant to, um, you know leverage tools or bring in, you know, uh, outside vendors to, to support organizations. But a lot of times that can be the most cost effective and, and biggest bang for your buck. Um, so, you know, when, when looking at um, the budget, right, you'll want to look at, you know, kind of what do I need to make my security team successful? And then, and then what, um, what mechanisms can I use, uh, pull in other resources to, to provide kind of the, the highest value for the dollar. 
Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Matthew, how about you? Yeah, I think um, like what's been talked about, what uh, how you should not approach it is you know some some type of percentage of the IT budget. That's that's not a a very practical way, especially um, with small medium sized businesses who have smaller IT budgets, right? Um, I, I think um, you know one of the things that you could look at or, or businesses need to look at is looking at technology like we was talked about a little bit earlier um, look at technology that's commoditized right so when you talk about your corporate email systems right it does it make sense to have that uh you know managed and, and set up on prem or does it make sense to move to you know like an office 365 um and i know there are generally concerns you know can be concerns around moving um, to those types of uh, those types of platforms, um, but really, what doing things like that do is it it enables the um, the IT department right to really focus in on things that matter right and um, not not that email doesn't matter but you leverage right the capabilities of of uh, those cloud providers and some of the security aspects that they can provide that maybe your teams can't, right? So when we talk about in the beginning about patching and vulnerability management, um, when you move to those types of solutions, you um, still are at the end of the day, somewhat responsible depending on, on how you, uh, what type of products you implement, but you can, you can use that as an effective way to manage, right? Your budget and um, in terms of uh, those services and really use the savings there, which are not just cost savings, like financial savings, but time savings. Because a, a lot of times, I think when we talk about budgeting for cybersecurity, a lot you can do a lot, right, with people and process, right, and and on the technology side. There are lots of things that are out there in terms of open source tools and things that can be utilized um, that don't have a direct cost, but they have a time cost, right? In terms of, um, you know, your internal FTEs and IT departments being able to, to get those things set up. And that's where by leveraging cloud-based um, platforms that um, are more commodity driven can save you not only in, in terms of cost, but that human cost, right? Yeah, this discussion came up in an earlier report of ours, and, and one of the contributors, I thought, summed it up brilliantly. He was talking about AWS in this case. He said, they spend hundreds of millions of dollars every year on security because their entire business rests upon whether or not they're secure. Do you think you can compete with that? Yeah, <laughs> oh, no. yeah. That's yeah, I mean, I, yeah, that's a great point. You know, I, you know the, the only thing, you know, that I would say is that that doesn't absolve you from accountability or responsibility, but oh, what no, it no. does do is it it gives you you're able to leverage right that expertise and get those core fundamental things that you would ha you know that your folks would have to do within your organization. You're able to leverage that right to to some capacity right. So gotcha, got it. We're getting close to the end here, so I want to see if we can't just get in our next couple of questions. Reasonably briefly, Chris is already on record as saying that the greatest vulnerability in, a, in his, his teleport operation has to do with the boundary, has to do with the point at which you know we, they're deciding where to how how and where to hand off traffic, uh, the, the traffic flow securely. Um, Justin, what what what's you what do you think is the biggest vulnerability in this kind of operation um, compared, for instance, to some other business? Yeah, so. I would I would probably echo that right the the boundary is is critically important and uh, knowing what's going in and what's coming out of the boundary is is what's going to allow you to make sure that the appropriate protections are in place and um, you know when when Chris talked about um, making sure that there's separation um, that is that that is a critical aspect making sure that there's you know you're not unduly exposing your environment um, and you know on, on the digital side right encryption encrypting that that communication is 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 important um, where, wherever possible yeah Matthew how about you 
Um, I, I think I would, um, I, I would probably come back to, you know, the, the, the end user, right? Whether that's within our own organization or in our customer's organization, right? Um, and not to say that, um, you know, that there aren't bad people trying to do bad things on, like uh, Chris mentioned, or was mentioned about uh, hacking satellite, you know, networks. I think at the end of the day, um, the, the, the educating and informing your employees and your users is really the key, right? And, and that's generally the, ta the most heavily used tactic um, because it can be done with the least amount of effort from an adversary perspective, right? Um, so just making sure that um, you're educating your employees, right, in terms of just good cyber hygiene, right, good practices. All right. Last question is, um, and it, we may have covered some of this, but but as you've noted, the threat profile is always changing, um, and it's because the hackers have a much bigger incentive than you do to um, – you have a much bigger incentive to penetrate you than you have to uh, to defend against them. What's the most cost cost effective way for businesses to deal with that fact? The fact that it's always changing out there. Um, Chris, let's start with you. Wow, <laughs> this one uh, from Switch on the from spot, a, huh? Yeah, well, I, I mean, from a from a a, a teleport uh, perspective. Again, I, I think the most cost effective way is to to have a um, an infrastructure that is accessible to your customer base, but in a way that um, you are protecting your protecting yourself continuously. So um, the the ability to have the um, the service, I guess, is um, within a, um, a a network infrastructure. So like. SATCOM Direct, we have a, a protected network that we then hand off to the customer. I think that's still the most cost-effective way to manage that change is always having control of the network base and then build on that base, um, expand it as required. So getting it in place is the key factor and then increasing that network um, in a, you know, a, a, a productive way. Um, in usage. So if it's a, a one gig service into the teleports and then eventually you have to go to a 10 and then the ability to expand that, but in, you know, in a controlled environment, I think is the most cost effective way to protect that data. Um, if you're continually just pulling circuits into the teleports and sending it out on MPLS and you don't have control of any of those circuits that are coming in and out of the teleports, you're putting yourself in a in a risk le at a higher risk level, whereas if you have the network infrastructure in place, and then increase that network and provide points of connectivity and have the control to that, I think it's the most cost effective way to manage it as you increase the requirements of uh, data throughput through the, the facilities. Okay, got it. Matthew, how about you? What do you think is the most cost-effective way to deal with the fact that the game is always changing out there and the threat profiles are constantly morphing? Yeah, I think kind of to add on to what Chris was saying, I think the one of the, cre the one of the critical things is just visibility, right? Is making sure that you have visibility into your infrastructure right whether it's the corporate side or the customer side because if you can't see what you're doing then you have no idea the uh, potential threats that could be um, occurring or the risk right that could be involved in that um, or the costs right very similar to what Chris uh, was alluding to like knowing what you're doing right and to be able to, um, and in doing so, you're going to be able to minimize your cost, right? And you're going to be able to understand uh, through that visibility ways that you can limit your um, that that attack surface or that risk surface, right? The the multiple methods or the means by which um, you may may be um, at risk. So, so when we're saying visibility, we're talking about. Um, a dashboard experience, which is you know shows you network status and lets you drill in. I mean, is it that kind of monitor and control? Um, 
Yeah, but but um, even more so, like what visibility into your infrastructure, like the the actual technical components of, um, you know, where you're handing what connection off to where, right, and why, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But but yeah, you bring up a good point. The monitoring piece of it that that's good, but actually knowing fundamentally your architecture, right, and and right. where you know what's internal, what's external, what services are they what data resides within those services, right, or within that infrastructure. So you're not duplicating or, you know, just, um, you know, adding another router, you know, uh, kind of willy-nilly or, or, you know, a handoff somewhere where you may be able to utilize other means that were already there, right? So Justin, yeah. last word to you, uh, the most, oh, I'm sorry, Chris, did you want to jump in there? Just to, to follow up on that a little bit further. Um, you know the the teleports in in years past it was always just somebody pulled in a circuit and you connected you know as matthew just said to another router in your in your teleport and it was just another vulnerable connection whereas if you're you know you have control of your terrestrial infrastructure in um and and you're managing that portion of the network and the vulnerability points can be controlled a lot more um, as opposed to your customer having control of that circuit that's coming into your teleport. <laughs> uh, sounds like trust, but trust, but verify. Yeah, your your customer is your best friend, and your and and sometimes can be your uh, your greatest vulnerability. Justin, so for you, what's the most cost-effective way for businesses to deal with this ever-changing threat profile out there? Yeah, so we we used to laugh in, in a lot of circumstances where where. You know, we would implement security through obscurity, right? Uh, well, people don't know about how this works, so you know, how are they going to hack it, right? Um, and, and that's not the case anymore, especially as we become more more connected. And so, you know, having and this goes back to, to what Chris and, and Matthew echoed, um, having standards and processes uh, in place, um, it goes a long way. Right, and and then focusing on those basics um, that, that we mentioned, you know, throughout throughout this kind of discussion, um, where you're implementing, you know, strong uh, fundamental security, and then um, making sure that that as things are added, right, it's following a standard process so that it can be controlled, and and that centralization or the sorry the the visibility piece, a lot of times that comes with centralizing a lot of uh, a lot of your, you know. Uh, capabilities, right? When you have uh, different groups doing similar things completely different ways, it's very hard to control. Um, and so, so coming together on on standard methods and processes will help um, help organizations adjust and change and move um, as as the the threat profiles change. If that makes sense. It does make sense. And I want to thank you all for sharing i think some really really important insights with with our audience uh, and so just as a reminder everybody we've been talking to matthew bybee who's chief information security officer at satcom direct uh, chris Falletra, who is teleport services director at comsat a unit of that company and justin padilla who is director of cybersecurity services at kratos space training and cybersecurity division so guys thank you very much for the time you shared with us thank you Thank you. Thanks for having us. Uh, coming up, we have a number of things. Um, in September, we're going to be publishing a report called New Antennas, New Opportunities, which is focusing on the issue of the rise of the flat panel antenna and looking at it from the point of view of the teleport operator who is seeking a competitive advantage. Uh, in October, we'll be publishing another one of our high performance reports based upon the data we've gathered from certification. Uh, this one's going to focus on the whole issue of how customers, customer QoS demands are not consistent. They actually vary, vary a great deal by vertical market and understanding that variance is important. And then in November, we'll be publishing uh, something I'm really looking forward to. It's called the Virtual Teleport, the Growth of Ground Segment as a Service. And we're going to be looking at both the virtualization trend in teleports, both uh, by traditional operators seeking greater efficiencies and market access, as well as the, this new generation of infrastructure light companies that are offering ground segment purely as a service.
All these reports are available free to WTA members and for sale to non-members. And I want to thank, as we close, I want to thank UTELSAT, Intelsat, Kratos, Liquid Telecom, NSES for helping us to put this program on. And I wish you all a very good day, uh, evening or morning uh, or afternoon, wherever you might happen to be. <laughs>